Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News Weekend. This past year saw reckonings with systemic racism in nearly every public institution. Now, Indigenous employees of the federal government are speaking out, saying, what about us? Reporter Brett Forrester spoke to several current and former staff at Indigenous Services and Crown Indigenous Relations. Here's what they had to say about their struggle against racism at those two departments. Elder Max Solace smudges and blesses the Kumik Lodge. It's a sacred healing space in one of the country's most colonial places. Some people have been terribly um, affected by their workplace here. <coughs> so they need help. The headquarters of the Departments of Crown Indigenous Relations and Indigenous Services. The faded red bricks tower over Chaudier Falls just west of Parliament Hill. Surrounded by medicine, the elder explains how profoundly working here impacts some indigenous employees. And I've seen several people completely broken down. And the term we use in the indigenous world is holistically. Their spirit has been killed. Their emotion has been killed. Their mental has been killed. The only thing they haven't done is a physical killing. But for all intents and purposes, they've been destroyed by this workplace. The streets outside are quiet, but inside the discontent grows louder. APTN News spoke with numerous employees who work within these walls. We agreed not to reveal their identities because they fear reprisals. One woman told us her manager once told her to leave her Indian status at the door when entering this building. Another woman said working here was the worst experience of her life, resulting in a complete mental breakdown. Letitia Wells, a university student and former government employee, says her experience was terrible. My workplace was so poisonous. It was so poisonous that some of us talk about suicide in that office where maybe one of us should sacrifice our lives to be heard internally. She says she was allegedly grabbed by a colleague which triggered her trauma as a survivor of domestic violence. Now she advocates for those too scared to speak out. Things need to change. You're running a lawless government that's harming us. We feel devalued, we feel abused, and we feel unsafe. There are no outlets for us. There are no promotions for us. When we do get promoted, we're set up for failure. In a joint email sent to all staff and obtained by APTN, the department heads admit they have a problem. They wrote, quote, we know that there remains a tremendous amount of work to do to eliminate discrimination and systemic racism in our departments and throughout the public service. We take all allegations of workplace discrimination very seriously and we need your help to eliminate them once and for all. We sat down with the top bureaucrats to talk about the turmoil. Crown Indigenous Relations Deputy Minister Daniel Kwan Watson argued acknowledging the problem is a big step. And the four of us uh, stood before several thousand employees and said this is real, we have no difficulty believing these claims. And I think for that to happen for the first time ever is not happened. I will agree with people that simply doing that is not a solution. That doesn't end things. But you cannot solve a problem that you don't admit exists. And the four of us Indigenous Services Deputy Associate Deputy, Deputy Minister uh, attacks, Valerie Gideon, uh, who is Mi'kmaq, says it's a tragedy they, they are committed to stopping. Um, systemic racism is not acceptable no matter where you are employed or where you live. Uh, across Canada and I think it is absolutely a priority for us as a department to not just eliminate it but also to prevent it. But the response didn't sit well with Solace. And I think that in the Deputy Minister's response you see the acknowledgement of harm 
there is no acknowledgement of fear and hurt. He sent the deputies an email in response, warning them, quote, the worst thing that could happen is that you speak empty words. He and others will be watching closely for action and, when needed, seeking refuge in the lodge. Brett Forster, APTN National News, Ottawa. And you can find more on that story on our website, aptnnews.ca. Well, as reported on Nouvelle Nationale earlier this week, a group home in Quebec's Côte Nord region is being investigated for neglect. And many of its residents are Inu. Here's that story by Sylvia Ambrose, translated and voiced by Lindsay Richardson. It was in fall 2020 that this spontaneous protest against child apprehension came to life in Wahatmak Maniutna. For years, the Innu population there experienced having their children taken away by youth protection workers, who placed them in homes hundreds of kilometers away, in communities like Blanc Sablon or Bekamu, where this institution is now being investigated due to overrepresentation of Innu youth and quality of life concerns. According to media reports, their education and cultural needs are being neglected. This woman's granddaughter was placed at the institution called the Richelieu Pavilion. And for confidentiality reasons, APTN has chosen to conceal her identity. By some reports, almost 80% of the pavilion's residents are First Nations, but the regional health authority overseeing the Richelieu Pavilion says these reports are false. By their account, Inu youth make up less than half of the center's population, but they did not provide exact numbers. Marius Picard, a retired social worker from Wahat Makmanyutnam, feels systemic racism contributes to the continued apprehension of Inu children. He's not surprised by the human rights investigation, but is concerned by the issue of language. The problem was the same in the time I was there. Soit au niveau de la langue, les jeunes disaient que il n'y avait pas le droit de de parler entre eux autres en Inu. It's something this woman says she witnessed firsthand while visiting her granddaughter. She says she was ordered to not cry and not speak Inu during subsequent visits. Picard proposes a solution, hire Indigenous and stress that candidates be fluent in Inu, but he says it's not an immediate or guaranteed solution. Mais là, la, la liste d'attente, ça sauterait. Mais là, ils ont dit non, on peut pas parce que le syndicat va nous sauter dessus. Euh, le syndicat voudra pas. C'est là que je me suis dit, euh, est-ce que vraiment ils veulent trouver des solutions ou bien donc ils font un comité rien que pour faire un comité. The granddaughter who spent so many years at the Richelieu Pavilion was not available to interview about her experience, but she gave her grandmother permission to share a poem she wrote. Quote, they say they don't want to assimilate us, that they've changed, but in truth, I'm living the same thing my elders did. I've had enough. 
in a statement the regional health authority stressed the clientele of the pavilion richelieu are not being neglected as other media have reported but quebec's human rights commission is looking into it at this time it's unclear how long the investigation will last a story by Sylvie Ambroise, APTN National News, Montreal. In Alberta, four people were shot early this past Monday morning on the Ochai's First Nation. All four are in hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. RCMP say two men have been taken into custody. They say it's too soon to tell if this incident is related to a confrontation that occurred the previous Saturday. Between an RCMP officer and a 24-year-old Ochai's resident that resulted in the death of the community member. To the East Coast now, and earlier this week we told you about a Mi'kmaq crab boat that capsized on the weekend, leaving one man dead and another missing in presumed drought. We now know the community had requested a delay in the crab fishery season days before the boat capsized off the coast of Cape Breton. Angel Moore explains. According to Elsie Botuk First Nation commercial fisheries manager Don Levi, the commercial crab fishery season started too early. So we had a call last Thursday on the call where industry representatives, including DFO, I requested a delay in the season until it was safe for all our boats to be out there. But the early season started nonetheless, and on the first day, the Elsie Botuk vessel, Tai Hawk, capsized and sunk off the coast of Cape Breton. Four crew members were rescued, but Seth Monaghan died, and Captain Craig Sock is missing and presumed drowned. Former Chief Susan Levi Peters says it was avoidable. I'm very sad that today the federal government, DFO, is not listening to our people. They continue to make their own rules and regulations, putting fishermen's lives in jeopardy. And not Community members drummed in memory of the fishers in hopes Craig Sock will return home. The RCMP are conducting an aerial search. We're hoping that they're going to continue because we need to bring our, we need to bring our captain back home. The Transportation Safety Board is investigating, and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans did not respond to an APTN request for comment. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Jabuktuk, also known as Halifax. Many jurisdictions are entering the third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that means new restrictions. Details after the break. Welcome back. There are a high number of COVID-19 cases being reported in multiple provinces as variant cases surge. And many of those provinces are taking new strict measures. APTN's Tina House has that story. By all accounts, Dr. Teresa Tam says the third wave is upon us as provinces across the country grapple with COVID-19 and the variants. Variants of concern are contributing to the current resurgence. The B117 variant is known to cause more severe illness and increase the risk of death. Dr. Tam added that the B117 now represents over 90% of new cases in Canada. In Ontario, over 3,200 cases were reported in just 24 hours. And with 500 patients now in ICU, these cases have prompted the government to announce stay-at-home orders across Ontario. This variant is moving hour by hour, day by day. So we have to move with it and be nimble and be quick. Starting Thursday, April the 8th, for the next 30 days, only essential stores will be open, like grocery stores and pharmacies. Big box stores will be limited to essential items only. Non-essential businesses will be eligible for government assistance and sick pay for workers is available as well. In places like Alberta, variant cases are now making up nearly a third of all new cases. Our reproductive rate that shows how quickly uh, the virus is growing or spreading is uh, higher for the variant of concern cases than it is for all of our cases together. In Saskatchewan, First Nations communities are now holding mass vaccination clinics to stop the ever-increasing numbers of cases in that province. 
Along with Ontario, British Columbia is also now considered a hotspot in variant cases across Canada, with over a thousand cases since April 1st. Let's ensure we don't lose any more ground. We can get through this surge as well. The variants have also crippled the Vancouver Canucks, with 21 players, coaches, staff and their families testing positive with the P1 Brazilian variant, essentially showing that despite your best efforts, no one is fully protected from the more transmissible variants. Chief Don Tom says he is very concerned. I think the concern is, is that it not only impacts uh, uh, elderly and um, but it, it's also we're seeing an uptick in uh, younger people being ho hospitalized and um, so I, I think that's a concern that uh, maybe those who felt that uh, the, the the concern or the um, the impact of the virus maybe it wouldn't affect them that we're beginning to see a trend that it's uh it is affecting all ages now back in bc dr shannon mcdonald says she wants to keep encouraging people to get vaccinated the vaccines were really meant to prevent hospitalization and death and that's what they're doing they've been very very effective tina house aptn national news vancouver Stay safe, everyone. Time for another quick break. And then we'll fill you in on a new course being planned for Indigenous stunt people in films. Stay with us. Welcome back. Another setback for the Arctic Winter Games. Every two years, the Arctic Winter Games bring together athletes from around the circumpolar north. Last year, they were postponed due to COVID-19. This year, more of the same. <laughs> Last year's postponement in Whitehorse happened so close to the event that teams still received their uniforms. The Games were then slated to be held in Alberta in 2022, but now the organizing committee has pushed it back to 2023 due to COVID concerns. Nunavut alone usually sends 300 coaches, players, cultural performers and staff. Another postponement is a huge blow to the young athletes. Yeah, it's a huge deal. I think in Nunavut, we compare the Arctic Winter Games though to the Olympics uh, to be able to walk out and represent your territory and your community, wearing that Team Nunavut gear, knowing that you worked hard and you deserve that spot to be there. It's a huge deal to miss out. And yeah, that's, um, we can't make it up. We can't make up that experience for the kids. So again, our attention has just been, what do we do to keep them active and focused on, you know, better days to come? Many First Nations count on dental therapists to help maintain healthy teeth. However, there's no program to train new dental therapists. So there's now a shortage in northern Saskatchewan, but there's hope that will soon change. Here's Priscilla Wolf with that story. First Nations communities, especially in the north, rely on dental therapists. Dental therapists are trained to do some minor work on teeth, and that helps fill the void of not being able to access a dentist. But there are currently no dental therapy programs in Canada. The only one we had was closed a decade ago, and it was located in Prince Albert. Tara Campbell, the executive director of Northern Intertribal Health Authority, says people in northern Saskatchewan need dental therapists. Because of the remoteness and of some of the communities, especially in northern Saskatchewan, there's significant access to care issues, um, especially with with oral health. Tarek says the majority of the current dental therapists are getting ready to retire. The workforce is over the age of 55 and only 5% of that is under the age of 35. So as you can imagine, with all the retiring dental therapies, there's going to leave a huge vacancy in the number of positions that are in our communities. But that's about to change because the dental therapist program is coming back to Saskatchewan. The program is a partnership with the University of Saskatchewan and Sas Polytechnic and will have campuses in Prince Albert, La Ronge and Regina. It will be the only one in Canada and Brian Hardlot, 
The Grand Chief of the Prince Albert Grand Council says spots will fill up fast. Here in our province, a lot of people, a lot of the uh, indigenous people will be coming from all over Canada, maybe a, uh, other other countries also. The indigenous people will come to a, uh, to the school, but the, uh, it, it'll be open. It'll be open for, for and I'm sure I, I'm, I'm confident that uh, that will be no, it'll be no problem to fill, fill the seats for the for the program. The program will be ready to accept students in March of 2022. Priscilla Wolf, AB10 National News, Saskatoon. A stunt actor from the Stony Nakoda Nation in Alberta believes there needs to be more Indigenous representation in movies. He plans to pass his knowledge down to Indigenous youth by starting up a stunt school. Tamara Pimentel has more. Stunt performing. It's something Marty Wildman wants to see more Indigenous representation in. A few years back they were still painting non-Indigenous folks red and painting their faces red and putting them on screen, right? And we kind of, you know, and there's 10 other capable stunt actors, indigenous stunt actors standing on the side and they weren't given the, the, given a chance. So we wanted to break that barrier and, and say we, you know, we have a voice and we got guys that are capable of doing it. At the end of April, this arena in Cochrane, Alberta won't only be used to train horses, but to train future stunt actors. Wildman of the Stony Nakoda First Nation was a stuntman for several movies and TV shows like North of 60. He's starting up Stunt Nation, a school where Indigenous youth can learn to do stuff like this. A good friend of mine, Nathaniel Arcan, and myself have been, uh, when we first worked together on a show called North of 60, we decided back then that we should be, uh, a lot of our First Nation stunt guys should be brought to the, you know, to the forefront and stuff like that because if we felt that uh, they weren't getting a fair chance at everything. So we kind of thought, well, we need to start paying it forward, start training our, our, our First Nations people and get them started, you know, whether it be just uh, doing stunt work or doing extra work, right, just trying to get them going into the industry. Starting with the basics, the students will be learning what's to be expected when they step onto a set. Fighting and, and stuff like that and um, horses, they're going to learn how to fall off horses proper way to follow horses like we've all been bucked off once or twice. The course begins on the last week of April. Wildman says spots are filling up quickly. We believe in our First Nations people. We believe in the power of our youth and our future leaders you know and that's what we want to do. Figured it's about time that our own people taught our own people how to do this. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Cochrane. Good luck to all those taking the course. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.